Um, just in case anybody's worried in mean, these times of great security, you know, the great God's security, this is not a machine gun, this is uh, an umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> Incidentally, I recommend it because, you know, the first thing in one's life that one loses always is an umbrella. Now, this is made by the cutting books, who do not pay me for saying this. Um, and you can't lose it because it's uh, got a nice little size of the belt. So, just in case anybody would be worried. Um, So, I'm going to start with a, this little poem which sort of begins, well it doesn't quite begin the book, but it's close to the beginning. It's called Coach Whip, but I've only seen, it's a very thin pink snake, and I've only seen one uh, in my 27 years in that house um, approaching the bird feeder. In a summer sudden seeming sown from the flower petals of cooling air, as if saying it coming down from the stars in the world's evening, who is this, what is this, do I know it, do I recognize long ago punishment to be crushed by feet of no longer natives? Thin pink coach whip slides along straight, not curled, slithering though at branches confluence. A woven tangle, coiled basketry circles, lightning pale, sunset colored, engulfs a bird feeding which had not kept the sky in its favor. Careful steps up the house thereafter, stamping up a little dancing noise in the absence of bells, not by my feet, nor by any fire of mine, shall this be hurt, or I be hurt by it, for I have never sinned, not in the world's morning, nor at any season, though unforgiven still. Yes, I recognize this is as far gone west as times wave now into another peaceless country. I did not. I was so concerned with uh, making you feel okay about this, this weapon that I didn't thank uh, my hostess uh, for that very sweet in in intro. And also the people who run this, I, I don't think I've ever read in such a magnificent space. So I um, wish I could take it home, that whole thing. Um, okay. This is called the Authorized Portrait. Dying to everything that needs to be done, the falsehood of requirements so that he may live. The face of one who is thinking death through with a knowledge greater than knowledge, greater than what anyone has ever known as wisdom. No longer a face now, but through art, an object in a des desert landscape. If this is to be used in a public setting, they will expect immense conclusions in philosophy and never find them. Done with now. This done with. That. How is all done with? And nothing left to do, like the miracle originally prayed for so far back the effort to remember is almost murder, O oh, gardenwood, one dawn light. An object totally novel, unseen before, unheard, unthought of, not even capable of being thought of. The poem stands unasked for, unrequested, without a destination you can specify. Last needle fell, he knows not when, all needles fallen from the trees, all trees now skeletons. And never more shall there be other trees, the very thought of tree unthinkable. 
Acquaintances have fallen from the trees. Life far too complex, too unraveling. No bones on ground among the needles. No birds in air. Not that last consolation, that last of freedom's definitions. The bird rowing air's waters, his primal visage of the sea. No feathers on the ground. How deep and startled the ending verdict, nothing to be awaited, all systems dormant, nothing to be imagined, nothing expected, no vision left over the screen. And in this silence, in this desolation, the comfort of this ravishment, a fresh ability to sleep, the quiet solace of a final beauty. Um, there are two poems in this book for South African women. One is for Angie Quirk, who uh, wrote a magnificent book on the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa called The Country of My Skull. I don't know whether it's been published in, in, in the States, um, but it's, it's well worth uh, trying to get it. Uh, the other one's for Nadine Gordon. Uh, I'll read the, uh, the ancient quote one because it's uh, shorter. Either you are receiving things which no one has ever sent, or you are sending off things which no one has ever received, and for that matter ever will, and when I begin, when I begin to say this, you believe I am talking nonsense, but it is not true. I am talking the only sense there is, which is what we do. You and I do and call it, what do we call it? Do you know what we call it when we translate a situation into life? When the tears begin, that is the moment when everything flows Drama is launched when language takes over a field which may or may not belong to it. No one is certain, but the dark drapes are brought out. The dark drapes are draped over the windows anyway. Lefties walk into the room handing out messages, interpretations concerning the great abandonment, at which time drapes turn red and we deal not with ink but with blood. We wish to send analyses concerning this, but no one will ever have learned the code, and we wish to receive encouragement and comfort in the light of it, but no one will ever have memorized the words. Then what we do, what we do, you and I, not to earn a living, never know, but simply to tell, so that we do not die, hands us the hands of no one, the blessing of the never met, the never heard of asking of us that we bow down and pray, that we weep, that we conciliate the powers that be and that do not be, but it is impossible, and we do not pray. Return to seven, sacred number, pass, go, do not collect. We suppose a stage is reached when nothing is heard any longer, when not one Word can pierce the iron-coated heart. What do they call it? Charity fatigue? Compassion fatigue? Which also sachets up and down with the stock market. Who has taken to him herself the pain of the whole universe, no one withheld, crushed by that hole, certainly not by sin. That way then, nothing laid in the tomb, not even an absence. Um, I sort of warn people that uh, when I read from this book, I guess from recent work generally speaking, that uh, they don't have to be told that we live in difficult times and um, so uh, the poems are very often dark. Um, but every now and again I try to stick in something vaguely resembling something amusing. Um, and there are three poems of that kind in this book called Three Globo Gardening Poems. This is number two called Hummingbird Sandwich. It's, all, it's also very much about gardening. Bad Year for Hummers. 
Everyone says so. They do not come to feed us. Experts say, oh, breeding season, or weather weird, or otherwise. Bummed, ill-humored, command the dwarfs to visit God. Black-chinned Hummer finally accesses feeders, and I address him in the very eyes, tell your amigos you either come here trooping, or I shall find you in the bush and make hummingbird sandwich. Peace in the land, I am not Truly cannibal, I swear this is the sole antagonistic feeling felt today. The art of gardening, I am in full discovery, is done by instinct, not armchair knowledge. The constant observation over as much as years of the behaviors of different plants, patience as great as Jove's for any does not make it in a given year with joy at causing it to prosper some years after this. The art is one as pleasing as any can be named and also is a healing art. The concentration and the sweating being such, it is impossible to dwell on great but altogether meaner matters. And healing not alone to doctor here, as to the patients, so some good's done, if not to wounded and disheartened people, <coughs> Homeless and countryless, jobless and foodless, as are the vasty millions we are supposed to feed by frequent answers to frequent begging in the mail, but to the songless and yet sentient plants smiling at us with blossom or with leaf. Ergo, since these good deeds always require one or more witnesses, I summon ye the hammers from the immensities lying out there in alpine desert, alpine rock. Damn it, gods of the poet's call no longer can descend, finding themselves to be deficient in the clothing of existence. So nature must provide her testimony to my fresh-minted kindnesses and rewired joys. Let hammers come in then, or perish in a sandwich. <laughs> Uh, the, to my mind, the most interesting points in this book are the two long ones, and uh, they're too long to read. Uh, one is about the great uh, Isenheim altar at uh, Colmar in Alsace in France, painted by uh, Matthias Grunwald, uh, probably one of the two or three greatest paintings in the Western tradition. Um, and the other poem is about uh, some work I did with an NGO in, uh, in Borneo, um, working against logging and um, the dispossession of taking of land away from uh, indigenous peoples. But so, so I mean, if ever you want to look at this book, I, you know, I recommend those to you. Uh, but um, the, you can't really do them at a reading. Um, there's, a, there's a set of, um, it's my trusty remedy against desert throat. <laughs> desert throat is a real thing. Well, nobody, nobody believes it, they think I'm just having a nice beer, but it works. There's a set of poems here, um, and you may, you, may, you may get, unfortunately, you may get the, the uh, desert throat effect, which is kind of squeaky and I hate it, but it comes and goes as it pleases. Um, there's a set of poems called uh, Dying Trees. <coughs> I'm sure a lot of you know that in the West we, over the last, uh, quite a few long years, we have lost literally millions, millions and millions of trees to um, um, drought on the one hand and the devastating uh, uh, army of, of uh, beetles who get into the bark of trees and destroy them. So these dying trees poems are 
concerned with that. They were published first in Minneapolis in a small edition and uh, got into this book. Um, the poems are about cancer, uh, personal cancer, tree cancer, and political cancer. Um, so there's quite a load of, uh, of cancer in there. This is number eight called Unraveling Shock. A hole torn in the fabric of the world, the web, the whole infernal weave through which life-giving rain is falling but mixing with the tears and with the blood. Dead body snatchers enter the mega corpses, much in the news these days, enter and grind bones, flesh and sinews down to dry tree bark, mixing with tree bark, crawling with the demonic beetles. They'll tell it later, no one expected this. Not one, patient, doctors, practitioners of every stripe. No one except the one whose daily work is close to prophecy, who feels it in his nerves or in her muscles. When news travels up fast and lodges in the eyes, all-seeing, all-pervading vision of disaster. And comes in like a mouse, we small, we modest, so we we practical mouse with big ears and popping eyes, looking this way and that, and not one tittle tattle phase by your huge presence. Later drowns in a bucket with a lizard. Everything drowns round here, getting to water, not able to get out again. Thus coming quietly, thus proving, thus stealing it, squatting thus quietly back of the house. How do the tears well up, well down again? What makes them well? The seeing eyes know not. What roots the change? Parent to orphan stop. Orphan to parent stop, then back again to tears. Look out beyond the healthy trees preserved in a close circle round the house for privacy. Look out the window over hills and dales of this Milagro country, see living green, see dying brown on each and every morning, mourn the trees. Criminal imbeciles who run the shows we live in, from top to bottom of their slimy theatre, have now decreed they will not solve the water. Matter of fact, they will not solve what we are made of the high percentage water in all of us compounded. They will not solve a single problem by the name of life we give to human business. They will prefer to dip their steel in blood to let the semen drip from, the, from off their steel into the blood and thus contaminate, infuse with every cancer, both body politic and body not so politic, just private, single, individual, but gives to other individuals their mean and color. Ghosts walk the hills and dales between the dying trees. Remember now, they say, with stab a tragic countenance, for when can privacy enter into collective? Those days, those days you took no notice of, counting them poor, dispersing them among the memories you could not value at their true worth. You could not recognize enough to feel. Who knows if these few days, these very days, were not those ones we live together here, the only paradise. And What time did we start? Do you remember? Seven ten. Um, since this book, which came out fairly recently, I've been working on some new things with the very cheerful title of Exitus Generis Humani, uh, End of the Human Race because I'm a terminalist and I don't think we're going to make it. Um, poetry reading is probably not the place to develop that, but anybody who's interested, <laughs> I, 
I'm ready to lecture. <laughs> so that is a weird bunch of poems. Uh, the, first, the first part, I think, has about seven poems. The middle part has three totally unreadable poems. And then the last part <laughs> has um, maybe also seven. This is number two of the first part. I was trying to get rid of some mm, difficult critters, uh, dangerous critters, and they were being unwilling to, to depart the planet. This is called the Homer. Black Widow climbs up this bucket against a stream of wet insecticide, long black arms waving as if to gather prey. What manifest multiple eyes? Poison mouse, bucketed to drown for faster death, scrambles in vain against a fall of foaming water. In a historic town, sunk in a foreign land, beggar roused from his lethargy by passage of a homer, intensifies his, intensifies his pleading to a rim of tears. The desperation, deep eyes in sable circles, the help me, help me, almost screams and scatters pigeons, scalding heart. For real? For theater? No way of knowing. Open scar pulses, the never healed inside the deepest heart also yells, help me to itself, as Homer and the beggar make one being. A ghost moves over landscape, a saint, they say, in later times, to resurrect a murdered man so he can point the finger at his killer. Horror buried in greatest eras, the times the storybooks love most of all. Then sun rises above eternal winter, ice not abating, never shrinking, but sun warming our blood and spirits. Homer walks into it, his armful stretched towards it, sun's ivory rays as if bright limbs of some promised salvation, honor, salute, wrap him, forgive him it might be if such conceptions floating above black skies are boundless provinces still sign and certify acceptance to vast Imperial grief. And this is number eight, no, sorry, number seven called Laughing, Singing, Praying Trees. With intent, never explaining, never justifying, never requesting anything for self, its vulpine face, ferocious eyes. Determined on a task no one had trained her for, no one ever suggested the task was feasible for one of such low cares. Year upon year into insanity the move enacted to breaking point, had not enrolled for such, not drafted. Trees laugh, sing, pray for this one, while this one prays for them, sits among waves, waiting for the next mission. No one is ever at this concert. No one ever configures music will continue. There is no possibility that solitude resolves itself, that conversation can turn thinkable, that there might be some contact between the proposition and the solution. Who can imagine a solitude so massive the consciousness of other cannot be formulated spoken but can be shown, a fright to neighbors who may ignore her but hear her sometimes being her being. How beautiful the scene that this takes place on, how lovely forth to tears the landscape plays, green alleys lined with flowers lead to vast meadows, these to green seas beyond the visibility today when flight is limited. This girl has never seen a sea. Not to be purchased, I, says the girl. Suckered and helped, yes, but never, never bought. 
She swears, refusing every shadow of any hard salvation, as if there could be some salvation in any different life. Voice of a mouse, a timid mouse, and fitted to the vulpine mouth which would devour this voice if the scenario allowed it. O oh, sweet beloved of ancient days, beyond a thousand wars, always the same, always from one disaster to the next, the characters pay no attention. Lover resolved, but grown inoperative, beyond the confines of the body, that body grown immense as Teramata. And had not single son, nor single daughter to populate the nation, on knees, mixed herbs, mixed drugs, balms, elixirs, mixed all the cures would lubricate the eyes as if her sockets illuminated heaven. The stars, I now remember, she never did see stars. She was so much the day's light was this mother earth. No night could drown a sun she would forgive it. She would forgive if only love could manifest at last and enter solitude in such a way that solitude perdured, but now forgiven and annealed. At last, a pregnancy self-generated by this love, O oh, child of light, come down to visit us, child of a captured fire and silver and gold, child-driven, innovative light. And then I will go back to a book called The Architectures, which some of which are in the selected poems. Um, they are uh, basically um, um, prose poems in three parts. And the third part is always about Eurydice and her transformed Persephone. Um, if you work on the, on the mythology there, I think you'll see that uh, Eurydice and Persephone are basically the same um, entity. Mm. So there were 77 of these or 70, maybe 77, I don't remember, uh, in a book called The Architectures, which um, was published in Tucson, Arizona, a few years ago. This is number one. Isn't it the end now? Isn't it the way you come home as if you were not coming? As if you were staying down and were going to eat of that food for all time, what is it, the amaranth seeds or puppy seeds or the marigold seeds, something intolerably like that, and would be satisfied to stay down there forever without anything to say to yourself in this new town, this novel we are trying to talk up here, or to say for yourself to tell us in unwearying detail what it is that our time needs to know that is so close now to finishing without ever having had its say. Isn't it the truth now that we no longer surmise where we are? That the art no longer knows where it is, that the art has repeated over and over that the city has to be abandoned to its aging, a brand new city going up beside it to explode into this century which is so late in manifesting, manifesting its particular commitment of the environment to the setting and the setting to the environment so that we have at last, what is it? A story told, a narrative in building? So that you ask yourself, looking out of all the windows of the dead, one after another coming to each window, parting the curtains, shrouds over the window's eyes, looking out onto that void, trying to make out the contours of the new city, but with the angle always wrong, the new buildings being just out of eyesight, just out of the field of perception, you ask yourself, what is their being? 
that very pale being? Are we that being, that ghost almost? What is that being trying to come up very slowly into the upper air? And is she making it? Have we determined it is a she? Is she making it? Or an it? Or a he? Or is she making it? Or we? Is she reaching that upper air? Is she coming up here to say something to us? Is it true that at last she is coming home? Is she coming home? Is she home? Is this her here beside us? Looking now back down in the opposite direction, proud of her raising herself to this unlooked-for stature of having made something out of herself and out of you into the scenario, Number three, where is the edge of the new and where do we go in this immensity which tells us we move from one place to another instead of moving inside one place which is always recognized? How do we know that we go from the known to the unknown? And has this new place not always been inside us since the beginning? that we go from the safe to the unsafe, the adventurous, the chivalrous, the quest, and are not draped in the safe, hidebound cloth of gold, tailored its thousand pieces like to a robe of abdication. When is it that we are in our landscape full of rural preoccupations and that we then move towards the urban threshold, manifesting a city's future wholesomeness in the traffic patterns of our brains? Is this Chita Nova or Chita Antica, and who can guarantee it either way? Out of the mouths of angels at every gate, flaying passes by as they are chased into this agglomeration. What is it that calls ascent and willing servitude, glows out in a breath of fire towards those latter distances, the maps of everything we have deserted forever? How did we stand still, and how then did the whirling universes stop flashing past us, small as the daughters of our eyes? To grow outward into that dense immensity, like to an ocean crystallized, a frozen summation of geography, giant vision of every planet in the galaxy, galaxy in the cosmos, how did our stillness breed this colossus, and why do we ever bother to read another single word or to write one where there is enough here to last in the diction of it for inexhaustible lifetimes? Where was she, still or running? Frozen statue of a running girl, frozen in bronze and in ice covering the bronze. That day in the park which taught us childhood chilled even more as the girl that was perpetually running away from us, flying away from her frozenness in space and in time, we that were supposed to be the ultimate freezing agents, the megalomanic oppressors and paralyzers of everything sentient, when already inside there, turning around that very moment at the apex of flight, there was a body, hers, flowing out of the metal, curving to begin the run back toward us, to return to this terrestrial island, to come back once again and forever to this house, at the center of everything, whose image all along the paradox of her flight she had never been able to flee from, had never shaken from her, never let go of, nurtured like the vision of a paradise to become. And now, uh, I'll finish with number seven. Who are we? that fled the thousand lives we did not lead, 
in order to escape the very one life that we were destined for, who after years, centuries, eons of fleeing, suddenly in one moment in a garden, a public park perhaps, felt cornered by that one true life, reeking at us from everything surrounding, trees, bushes, lawns, benches, people sitting there, children playing with hoops, skittles, little yachts on the pond, windows of houses overlooking the park, potted nightingale flowers tucked into balconies, servants living under the roof and looking down onto the park, wishing they could take the air out there, and we were overcome by a smile so vast we had not enough mouth to smile it with all our teeth shining like white suns the way they shine in the new countries on the new beaches where the new nations rush along the strand in their joy. Who went to those countries at the time of their liberation and asked of them whether men still feared death now that they were part of everlasting life to come home saddened, reporting they still feared death and that the human condition had not changed. Who wrote innumerable words, adding up to something we felt a part of, in whose reality we sank with coolness, gratitude and the immense comfort of those who have at last found home, whereas all the countries surrounding us withered into a perpetual frost and the houses we had lived in became encased in ice. The memories of those who had known us mirrored over, the like, over like ponds in winter, geese only shattering the silence turned south over our frozen decoys. How did she then, belonging to the people for whom mind is an insult and not the ultimate glory of our state, how did she come down, supposedly to comfort us, with her hoops, bangles and rings, prodding us interminably into jumping, into leaping through these rings that she thought were fire, which would test us and prove us and make us into man, but only lifted us aloft from the true conflagration, flew us above our burning sense of the one life lived, turning liver to salt, spleen to white flower, seeming to challenge the lilies of the field, white on the white expanses, their whys and wherefores, their lovely concentration into falls of cowardice, of petrified desire. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm quite serious. 
Um, <laughs> there must be other stuff, but it, it sort of gets lost in a multitude of drawers, and I have no idea what happens when I'm gone, which is a bad thing. <laughs> if anybody has any ideas, I always welcome them. Um, I showed you others, postcards, uh, photographs of one sort or another, uh, aviation history prints, um, A lot of poets, as I know, I know you know, a lot of poets have taken that corpus as the founding uh, myth of their poetry. Um, I think Davenport wrote a very fine book on pounds uh, in the city of complex. And uh, there's an enormous amount of other stuff. And if you go into the Greek initiated mysteries and so on, it's, it's a lot of that too. I don't know if that's a big help. <laughs> when did you consider yourself a poet? Age five. <laughs> Your first poem at age five? Yep. Do you remember it? Uh, well, uh, mm, no, I don't think I do. My mother kept it for years. It was in French. Um, no, I don't remember it right now. My, I've reached the age when my, uh, that kind of memory has just disappeared. And uh, other, other memories are coming in, but um, not, not of that type. Uh, and then afterwards, I think I wrote a bunch. I wrote one. At, I had a. I was at school and was told, uh, uh, told as a part of an exam, I was told to write an essay. We were told to the class, and I produced a poem. And all the teachers in the school proceeded to go to our home and, and sort of congratulate, <laughs> congratulate my mother and father on producing this creature. Um, I was totally bewildered. That was also in French. It was called the Swallow. Uh, and um, after that, it took some time to uh, to get cracking because uh, parental pressure was such that uh, reasonable, accepted, sanctified uh, modes of employment were to be explored <laughs> uh, and uh, possibly. 
adopted. <laughs> none, none of this, uh, none of this weird artistic uh, stuff. So uh, that had to be dealt with, and uh, I dealt with it basically by uh, I'd gone to i gone to Paris after finishing at Cambridge because I felt that I was still very French and wanted to write in French, which was a disaster. But in the course of that, um, I discovered anthropology because there was a movie called Rendezvous de Juillet in which the young hero went to, who was a, um, a sort of, well, in the film they called him an ethnographer, but the, the, the real anthropologist would be totally contemptuous of this, as if he was just a, you know, an explorer or whatever. But he went to the Musée de l'Homme, the, the Anthropology Museum in Paris, and I said, yeah, this is, this is outrageous. I'm supposed to know every museum in every city I go to. I've never been to this place, so off I went. And was overwhelmed, and in a corner, um, I found uh, that uh, some courses were being offered. And um, so I went home and trembled for three days and came back and enrolled. And I didn't want to tell anybody. I've always been heavily into keeping secrets. Uh, my grandmother, as a good French grandmother, felt that I was probably going to misbehave somewhere at you know, 2 o'clock every afternoon, but she didn't say anything. And uh, then, disaster, my parents turned up uh, a week before the final exam, so I had to confess. Well, you see, I think I may have a job, uh, sort of. I mean, I'm preparing for one. What, jungles? Savages? <laughs> Impossible. Yes, but you know, eventually, possibly, lectureships, prefer oh, well. <laughs> so anyway, that was tolerated. I'm an anthropologist, all of which put a huge lead weight into the business of writing poems. And so, um, in essence, I had to wait until the moment in the botanical gardens of Highland, Burma, to uh, write something that looked like Gerard Manley Hopkins. <laughs> totally disastrous. Uh, but from there, little by little, uh, other things happened. Is that? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, and I'm not sure I understood right, but it sounds like English is then your second language. Well, nobody knows, to be honest. Um, <laughs> because I was born in Paris, and uh, my parents lived in Paris, and uh, I had a string of uh, governesses, uh, French governesses, one of whom became very famous for pricking pins into me so that I would scream and she would then put me on the phone and, and my parents would have to rush back until my, father <laughs> <laughs> until my father discovered what was going on and threw her out of the house. But it is possible that uh, French, therefore, uh, I don't know whether my parents had a policy, you know, that my mother would speak French and my father would speak English. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I do know that when we left the continent a week before the war for England, because my father, being British, had to report to the, the army and so on, um, I was put into an English school and was absolutely terrified because I felt that uh, I was a total stranger. I, I mean, I suppose that within a week or two, some English must have manifested itself. But um, I, I don't remember that. I just remember the terror of going into a class. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to us about your interest in shamanism and uh, how that interest informs your practice of living as a poet and writing as a poet. Well, you know that uh, my colleague, Jerry Rothenberg, are you familiar with his work, uh, has uh, put out this uh, uh, equation between contemporary poetry and shamanism, which uh, has you know, gained a lot of uh, 
promoted love interest and so on and so forth. Uh, native peoples have a tendency to say, are you kidding? Um, <laughs> there's a poem I quoted some essay about this uh, by a, a Native American poet called Wendy Rose, sort of, you know, do you know that poem when you, something about when you feel you want to become an Indian and then da 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 well, you know, go home and forget about it. Uh, but, um, I mean, I suppose, you know, I, I, I was, I mean, I suppose I, I was trained as a, as a shaman in Guatemala in the course of my work. And um, I did do a certain number of uh, seances in which, which seemed to go down reasonably well, except that since I wasn't very satisfied with my Maya, I grabbed hold of a Latin prayer book and uh, did the whole thing in Latin and nobody knew the difference really. So, so um, I, 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 I don't know, you know, that, that whole business ties in with something I was talking about the other day, this lecture at the University of Chicago that I was trapped into doing, um, about the element of prophecy in poetry, uh, something that I call the idyll, which is in the center of a model of poetic production, uh, the idyll is a point at which, in the course of writing a poem, some people experience, even if it's only me, the feeling that poetry cannot stop. That literally, you're, you're set to go on forever. It is precisely at that moment, precisely at that moment, when the downward path, I mean, I'm going to tell you the whole poem. <laughs> down of path uh, occurs and you go away again from process into structure and the, you know, the poem ends well or not well according to a bunch of, of uh, criteria. Um, and I, I, can, I, can, uh, I ironically I call the peak of the idyll the, the rapture and I'm sure you know what I'm uh, being ironic about. Um, and I tend to compare it with Dostoevsky's uh, you know, a famous description of epilepsy in which uh, at the moment when you think you are in the world and all its knowledge, you know, the whole thing crashes into erasure and you fall on the floor foaming at the mouth. Well, I don't know all that many poets who foam at the mouth, but we do, we do sometimes feel that way. Um, and there were all sorts of interesting phenomena which maybe I'll write about someday. Uh, feelings of exhaustion when this thing is done, you know, so many other things which uh, probably have some relation to the shamanic experience because uh, you are you are ultimately, as far as I'm concerned, talking to the dead and talking from the dead. Uh, in poetry. In fact, my present definition of a poet is somebody who is actually dead. To the world. Dead. Um, but, you know, this is pretty complicated. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think many contemporary poets would be very happy with that. Uh, <laughs> well, how about we just uh, have another round of applause?